headphones will help my party. Okay. Are we rolling? All I ever do is think about what's to come and how it's gonna be when my work is done. Hey, I'm Craig. How are you doing, Simon? That's Craig, Simon. Simon, oh, Craig, good. Okay, good. Cool, man. Um, Thank you, man. Good, thanks. How's your day going? You buddy? managed to sort uh, log Skype out. Uh, Skype, if you haven't been in for a while, you're like, Christ, what was the uh, login again? And <laughs> yeah, I haven't used Skype for years. I, I don't know why. It just uh, kind of fell by the wayside with uh, WhatsApp and. All these other ways of communicating, I guess. Hundred percent, yeah. It's starting to rain in Cape Town, which is great. That's cool, man. We've got um, oh, that's good news. a lot of a lot of a lot of rain forecast for today. Oh, awesome! So, is yeah, it, you're going to go outside and like flip like, and dance in the rain, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, so, when it rains, I just sit on my stoop and and watch it come down. It's just such a great feeling to see oh. the rain come down after. After worrying about water constantly for the last year or so, yeah. no, I mean I think that's basically why I make music and why I write songs. Yeah. Um, because, you know, when I was a teenager, and you know, like when you're a teenager, you you struggle with stuff. Yeah. All teenagers do, and I think that's why teenagers particularly love music so much because, you know, they're they're songwriters who can have to have the time just to like sit and, and work out how to put into words and music mm. all the stuff that everyone else is too busy to actually think about but sure. they're feeling it you know and and so yeah when I was a teenager there were songs that would just like make me feel like I had a, an emotional home you know where whereas yeah. at home there wasn't space for those feelings and wow. so music music became the place where I could um, have an emotional world I suppose course wow. but, um... Woo -hoo -hoo -hoo. <laughs> how's it going Gareth? Hey guys how are you my man how's things going yeah, on this awesome. monday for you yeah. yeah brilliant buddy how about you yeah really really good thank you bud Sun is shining in London. <laughs> it's been a great weekend. The, the yes. England won the soccer yesterday, so the vibes in the city were awesome, which is cool. It's a bit epic. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Really cool. It's one thing I really you... dig eh, is like when the soccer is on, like in London, and I'm sure the rest of the UK, just the vibe is like electric. As long as England is in, it's flipping cool. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> As I can imagine, you're back from Portugal, so that's cool. You've, you've got your desk and you've got your setup all back, so this is good. Yes, yeah, today is going to be epic. <laughs> Welcome back. <laughs> yeah, you know what? It, uh, it's epic as well that we have having a good chat to a musician this week, which is really cool. It's a little bit different. We, we're really excited uh, about it. We, we're chatting to a man named Simon van Gent, uh, and he's from the Simon van Gent Band, in from Cape Town, they're an introspective indie folk rock band uh, from Cape Town, South Africa, whose music has been described as a homegrown, unique blend of folksy, foot tapping, red wine, fireside poetry. How awesome is that? Yes, that's awesome. It just makes you want to listen to the music, eh? <laughs> For sure, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, some of the things that we talk about in this in this chat are. Uh, first of all, serendipity and one around how he met uh, Christopher Ryan, um, which is a really well-known podcaster in America. And then we talk a lot about um, Christopher Ryan's book as well, um, as well as evolution. Um, we touch um, we touch on depression, which is um, you know something really important to talk about and something which um, Simon has actually suffered from a fair bit in his life. Uh, then we also go through music and vulnerability, uh, the catharsis of music, um, and what the sort of struggles are that musicians face these days. Uh, then, you know, we also talk about uh, religion, uh, therapy, and the importance of 
our formative years and how they kind of shape us uh, when we're older. And um, yeah, so it's a, it's a really like sort of deep chat. We go into a, you know, a lot of stuff. It's probably not like maybe all of our other chats, but we think it's such an important chat because so many people are actually, you know, suffering from depression um, or anxiety or something of some sorts. Um, so, so there's a lot of importance in this chat. Um, and then just a bit of housekeeping, actually. So uh, we just wanted to kind of let people know that we, we're still sort of tinkering with things and messing around and not, well, not messing around, but just trying out new stuff. And uh, we're going to be sending out an email campaign that looks slightly different uh, this week. We just want to, you know, try it out, see, see what happens. And then we have another exciting event as well, don't you, Greg? Yeah, so we did our our first uh, Facebook Live event uh, yesterday. And yeah, how awesome. It's just something we're going to start doing more regularly. Uh, it's uh, obviously quite different to uh, what we currently do with our podcast, which isn't live. Even though we don't edit much, uh, it's pretty much raw that we put up. Uh, it still is different, you know, if you sneeze or you cough or you you, you want to rephrase something, you can. Um, however, on the Facebook Live, you 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 laid bare to all the, your idiosyncrasies and your ums and ahs. <laughs> exactly. <which> you, <laughs> and it's a lot more of a, a vulnerable space uh, to be in. And our guest this week, as you mentioned, um, Simon, uh, is really really vulnerable in this chat and uh, we're very grateful for him because i think like you said a lot of people are actually dealing with tough issues like depression uh, as as he is and um and he totally just you know told us what it's all about what it's like to to go through that and his vulnerability was like um really really special and i and uh, we, we really appreciated that hey absolutely i think that there's so much to take from people that are willing to show their vulnerability for me vulnerability is actually a massive strength you know if you are able to show people you know that you are or tell people that you are struggling and that you might need help and that everything is not as great as you know you might hope it is that is actually a real strength and showing you know just showing who you are uh to the world like on the platform that we have you know as a podcast and then you know on social media and whatnot and being out there forever um is a massive vulnerability and like you said you know uh, th we speak about so many important topics that uh, a lot of people are suffering about suffering with and we don't necessarily talk about these enough at all uh, depression being a big one you know it's a huge part of our society these days and uh, another thing we, we, we talk about is like his childhood and, you know, how his childhood basically affected him so much, which in turn basically led to a lot of his depression. And then there also the importance of therapy. And the important part of this is that it's not something that you must just sort of shy away from. It's something that is actually really needed depending on the type of person you are and what you suffered from. But the other important part of the therapy is that it's important to find the right person. And it took Simon a few goes to find out who that right person was, didn't it, Craig? Yeah, indeed. And, you know, it also took, as he mentioned, some amazing friends. You know, he had mates that were brave enough and honest enough to say to him at some stage that, maybe he should go and speak to someone they could see what he was going through and the strength which he's to this day super grateful for of his friends enabled him to make that first step to to actually seek a therapist and it has as you said been an ongoing journey and which he's still um, going through but he's really may come in along in leaps and bounds and he's started to find some of that self-worth uh, uh, you know, that he's been searching for and not only through the therapy, but through music. And it's quite an amazing cycle or, or sort of um, what happened to him basically was, you know, 
having these struggles as a youngster, and I think most people can sort of identify this on some level with this on some level, but he found musicians that sort of spoke directly to him and he identified with what they were saying and the feeling within the music and that helped him get through some of these really tough times in his life where he had lost his self-worth or his um, drive in his life and through these musicians had found some of that and the amazing thing is that now he is a musician himself and the full circle aspect of it is that he plays music that is full of his his own feeling and emotion and he gets a certain catharsis from that but more importantly he's sharing this knowing that someone somewhere out there is listening to this as well or his music as well and may just identify with that music just the way he did with some of the other musicians that he had listened to so there's this real um, full circle um, effect and cyclical effect that's happening which is uh, really really cool and actually very valuable um, so we actually today are going to do something different with the intro hey Gareth yeah absolutely and we uh, we really love Simon's music and he has some super cool songs so for like the next sort of 20 seconds just after we finish up here you're going to hear his one of his uh, great songs called uh, Watermelon and um, yeah so you're going to listen to that and then we're going to start our chat off with uh, Simon Van Ghent and listen to him and hear what it's like for him to be ridiculously human. All right, we are here with Simon van Gent all the way in a rainy Cape Town, which is awesome. Good morning, sir, and uh, how's your day been so far? Good morning. Yeah, I know. Pretty chilled so far. Um, did a bit of work, watched the rain a bit, checked on my water tanks, <laughs> backwashed the pool because because uh, the pool's probably going to overflow later. We've we, they're, they're predicting about 20 mils of rain today, which is going to oh. be really, really good. Oh, it's amazing. Yeah. But I mean, can you can you just like explain a little bit about what it's been like the last year or if it is having these water shortages? Um, well, we've all got into the habit of not flushing the toilet as much as we would. Um, if it's yellow, let it mellow. If it's brown, flush it down. You know that, that story. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I actually have Airbnb guests and I tell them that whenever they good. check in. and. Most of them are comfortable with that idea. Um, yeah, and don't shower for longer than two minutes. No, obviously, no watering the garden. Yes. Everybody's planting water-wise plants in their gardens now. Wow. Um, yeah, and so things got very tense a few months ago when our mayor Helen Zilla, sorry, not Helen Zilla, uh, Patricia Delille, announced that we were going to run out of water. Um, and the so-called day zero was predicted for, yeah. I think, a week ago would have been day zero. Wow. And everybody panicked and uh, the news went all over the world because yeah. I saw on, you know, online that there were news articles everywhere. Um, and yeah, I think it had a quite, it's had quite a negative impact on tourism actually, because just in terms of really? my Airbnb bookings, they oh, really? down. Um, yeah. And I think, I think the reason she did that was because she actually just, they needed to scare everybody into into taking the water restriction seriously because seriously. people just weren't weren't people were just carrying on as normal. You know, I, I suppose about half the people in Cape Town were taking it seriously, and everybody I know was taking it seriously and doing what they should do. But you know, a lot of people just didn't actually give a hoot, and yes. and it was only when that announcement when when that announcement was made, suddenly everybody started acting, and then our our water usage dropped down to a more manageable level. Wow. Um, yeah, and, and then we got some farmers out, I um, can't remember exactly where, other side of the mountain, some farmers who had a, had a dam full of ec extra water they didn't need, donated it to the city, and let, wow. they opened their dam, and it flowed, flowed into the Tiavatas Kloof wow. Dam, I think. And that was one of the big reasons why they were able to take away this idea of day zero. That's incredible. Um, yeah. Gee, that is amazing. But, we, you know, so we... Yeah, it was a pretty cool 
thing that those farmers were able to save us. Because I think, you know, they'd done all the irrigation for the year. They didn't actually, you know, they were going to be fine without that water. Um, yeah. Yes, man. But now now we are actually slightly better off than we were this time last year in terms of the dam levels. And um, if, yeah, I mean, we're just all hoping that this winter is going to give us a good rain. I mean, we've had four years of drought now. Jesus. And the longest... The longest drought we've ever had has been three years. Huh. So this has happened in the past. This has happened in the past, but the rains have always come. And so this yeah. is why we got into such trouble. And also because there's, there's so many more people in Cape Town now, I guess. Yeah. And um, there just hasn't been enough maintenance of the infrastructure and upgrading the interest, infrastructure yes. and building new dams. Yeah, but the, the city's definitely been kicked into action and they're putting in desalination plants and... Um, ah. so they're, they're setting up systems to extract groundwater. There's a lot of water in the aquifers, the, the Table Mountain Aquifer and the Cape Flats Aquifer, and they've got a lot of ah. water. Anyway, this is this is turning into more of a water report than a music. <laughs> yeah, no, but it's imp- interesting. You know what imp- I mean? It's, <laughs> it, it is. It, it was. I was watching like some of the sort of unique ways that guys were um, saving water or using less, at least. And there was this one. Uh, Afrikaans guy posted this video on Facebook and he, he he had made this like mini water not pump thing but like just a container out of a two liter coke bottle. It fit on his head. No, no, it didn't, oh, it didn't oh, fit okay. on his head, but it had like a little. <laughs> no, like, there was. Yeah. <laughs> no, there was this great guy. He had he basically had a bowl and he filled it with water and he plunked it on top of his bald head, so it <laughs> sealed on his head completely. And then he and then he just lifted it up for a second. And the water ran down, and then he soaped himself, <laughs> and then he lifted it up for another second, and it started, so he just lifted up to rinse himself until it was all finished. There's a YouTube video; it's brilliant. Clever. Um, <laughs> I'll find it. Got to yeah. find that one, but it's so cool. But this guy, like, he had had this little, like, like two liter Coke bottle. That all you did is you just squeeze the water a little bit so that it wet your hands, and then you wash, you put soap yeah. on, and then you squeeze it a little bit again, and then you got rid of the soap. It was like so much better than turning on a tap. You know what I mean? You used like. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw years. that as well. With, with that little pi- tiny pipe that yeah. comes out of it. I think that I think that one. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Necessity is the mother of invention, though. Hey, and uh, yeah, but yeah. Uh, hey, how, how was it sitting on your on your veranda on your stoop and uh, just taking a moment, taking in some of the the first good rain? Uh, well, yeah. It's always. I mean, it's happened a few times. We've had some good rain already, and it's always just. I can sit there for like an hour just staring at it because. It just feels so good. I don't know. I mean, I've always been like, I've always loved the rain, you know. Yeah. Mm. But um, I've also got water tanks on my stoop, so I can actually hear the water trickling into the water tanks. What a pleasure! Um, and I'm hoping, yeah, I'm hoping today they're actually going to fill up completely because yes. at the moment they're about half full. And what do you Shit. use that for? Do you use that for like your uh, like showering or just the what? What do you use it for? Garden. Yeah, just uh, just everything, you know, right. just like. Whenever you yeah, carry buckets and put it put it in the toilet and wash with it, whatever. Mm. There's just yeah, and the garden. Not in the winter, you don't need it for the garden, but because yeah. um, it's you know it rains enough in the winter here. Yeah, but yeah, and then in the summer it'll be definitely I'll be able to slowly use it throughout the summer for the garden and to top up the pool and yeah yeah stuff. Like that. Oh, I mean, if good. everybody who if every, if everybody who had space for a water tank put in water tanks, mm. it would be like having another dam, you know. So it's actually, and I think a lot of people have, you know, in the last six months, you've seen so many trucks driving around with water tanks on the back. So obviously everybody is putting, has, a lot of people have been putting in water tanks. Yeah. But it's just a good idea anyway, isn't it? Like, just, just makes sense. Yeah. Even if it's not like a, I mean, this yeah. is, this is a glimpse of the future, you know, the planet yeah. is getting hotter and, Drier and places like South Africa, there's lots of dry areas that are just going to become drier and drier. So, yeah, scary. Yeah, I think every, everywhere in the world, really. For yeah. sure. You know, Cape Town, Cape Town, Cape Town made the news because we were one of the first ones to have this problem, but I think this is going to become pretty standard. Yeah, scary stuff. Yeah. So, Simon, what is a, a normal, typical, or is there such a day? That exists for you. What does a typical day in the life of Simon van Gent look like? Um, well, it depends on my work situation because I do typesetting. Um, that's my day job. 
which is basically the layout of books working in a program called InDesign. And I do that at home. Um, so if there's work, I just work uh, and mm. get the work done as you know as fast as I can. Um, but the work is erratic, so you know there are a lot of days when there's no work. And mm. then um, if I want to be productive, I actually need to be really disciplined, and I I like to open up a Word document and make a little table and draw you know a little timetable with dividing the day up into into hours and um, set myself tasks. So at the moment I'm busy learning um, logic, which is the the Mac audio recording suite for you know for, for producing music basically. Cool. It's what they call a, dig, a, a digital audio workstation. Um, so I've been watching YouTube videos that teach you how to logic. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then practice the guitar, practice the piano. Um, you know, I'm busy learning the piano. I'm not just that good on the piano, but I'm trying to get better. Um, recording, messing around with recording new songs. Um, also, I'd like to get out and climb the mountain. I climb the mountain quite a lot. Mm. Like I've got people that I climb the mountain with twice a week. We go up in the evenings with head torches. Nice. Wow. Really great. Yeah. Mm. Well, which part yeah, of the we, mountain? We usually leave, well, um, above Camps Bay or up on the front of Table Mountain. Um, there's an amazing number of really great routes you can take up Table Mountain. Um, a lot of them in, involve a little bit of scrambling. So, <laughs> you know, it's not, not not for your average walker, but just amazing, amazing wow. routes. Yeah, and then we often, especially in the winter, we end up coming down in the dark with head torches. But if you wow. sit in in the city bowl and look up at the mountain in, on any evening after dark, you see these like trains of of um, trail runners with head torches. They're just oh, cool. like, people are running over the mountain. Yeah, at night it's amazing. Just and especially on Lion's Head, you see like rivers of head torches coming down Lion's Head. Wow, <laughs> that's, that, cool. that's so cool. I can imagine it must be a bit is hairy coming down there. Yeah, what? Lion's head. Well, yeah, like in the dark. In, in, in the dark, yeah. Yeah, it can be a little. I mean, yeah. I mean, you, you don't you don't come down the really treacherous treacherous routes in the dark. You stick to the, you know, there's Castile's Port and there's um, like uh, Platteklip Gorge, which are pretty straightforward. Okay, cool. So, and we also have um, cable car season card a season that's a card that gives you a year's free rides on the cable car Ooh. so ah. it, we sometimes come if we go all the way to, to the cable station we'll just come down on the cable car as long as there's not too much of a queue because she's in the summer yeah you Jeez. can queue for two hours at the top to get down so it's quicker quicker to walk sometimes yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> tell me about it and, and what, what so can you just explain a bit about typesetting what is that exactly uh it's just layout so you know any print or even online you know even um, digital publications that text has to be placed placed there and, and and the pictures have to be put next to the text and it all you know the the, the the text has to be formatted in the correct font and the correct heading levels and yeah, yeah it's layout it's just you know i mean we use the word typesetting because that's what people used to do is they actually used to have physical blocks of type that they used to put in, you know, like you remember, you used to get those uh, printers yeah. Yeah, trays yeah. that if, mm. but every 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 teenage girl had one in her room with her little yeah. trinkets in it. Yeah, yeah. And those yeah. were those are what people used to use to typeset. They used to put the the blocks of type in there, um, and obviously now it's all on the computer, so it's much quicker and easier. Yeah, for but sure. But it's the same idea. It's the same idea, you know. And is that something yeah. that you do like um, for like newspapers or magazines or is it a mix of books? I and do. Authors? No, it's 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 for me. It's mostly school books. So like Cambridge University Press is one of my um, mm. clients. Uh, yeah, and Maskew Miller Longman Pearson Education. Yeah, these big school book publishers. Ah. So I oh, free right. write. So so they'll send me an email and say, do I want to do a book? And I'll say, yeah, cool. And I mean, I could really do it from anywhere in the world, you know. Now, um, yeah. 
I've got a printer, but I haven't actually used it for work for years. You know, in the old <laughs> days, you used to have to, once you typeset um, a book, you'd print out the whole book and the, you know, you'd have to deliver it to the publishers and then they wow. would mark it up with a pen and send it back to you and you'd implement <laughs> the corrections. But now it's all just via PDF and, and most um, editors and proofreaders are quite happy to just mark up the PDF. You know, there's a way to actually digitally mark up a PDF. So it doesn't actually involve printing paper, printing out anything on paper anymore, which is great. Oh, wow. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And and so, uh, it, how long would is one? Can that take like a few weeks to get sort of one publication done? Or um, if if everybody's um, working hard, it could be done in like a week or two. But generally, the way it works is it drags on over like months and months. Um, <laughs> sometimes, up, you know, up to six months or a year, even just with. Wow. Yeah, it's also because there's a whole process where they have to submit the books to the various education departments. I mean, I've just done books for Cameroon and for, for um, Zimbabwe, and those books get submitted. They get couriered up into Africa, and then they, the people there sit with them and decide mm. whether they need them changed or, um, yeah, so it's a whole slow, long process sometimes. So, so yeah. do, you, do you get to learn, like, like, new languages and stuff like that? Because... I'm assuming the Cameroonian ones are you in know, their language and no, they're actually in English. The ones, okay, the, the, yeah, yeah. The, I think because these are for um, high school, like I suppose matric or whatever we call it now, grade twelve level. So um, I think they mostly end up by by then. Most of the science and these are science books. I guess most of the science teaching is done in English. I don't know, actually. Okay. But yeah, I, the thing is, I don't really have to engage with the um, text too much. Usually, it's just more visual, you know, laying it out. Although I do have to do text corrections, and then I'm just doing exactly what I'm instructed to do. So I don't actually have to understand the language. Okay. Right. You know, I've I've done. I've done um, books in languages I don't understand, and it's fine. Yeah, it's just like I do what the editor tells me to do. Cool. And, and you say that a lot of them are science books. Are, are you a little bit science inclined? Do you enjoy like a little bit of that as well? Yeah, I've actually I studied science. I've got a um, honors degree in microbiology, oh. so I'm very I'm very much like scientific in my thinking. Um, yeah, I mean, I I see the world in the way you know from the from a scientific point of view. I I um, learned about evolution actually in high school already and studied right. it a lot in, at at university. So right. that like made me realize everything that had been teaching me in RI at school was complete rubbish. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, you know, so so <laughs> that's what I mean when I said it's informed, it's informed my worldview. Um, were you upset about that, but <laughs> No, no, I wasn't I wasn't upset about it. I was just like, wow, you know, there's this other incredible story that, that we weren't told. Yeah. You, you, which is far far more incredible than all these miracles they talk about in the Bible, you know. Like, you know, that, that 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 life evolved through this very kind of simple mechanism that Darwin like worked out and it's such a simple when once you understand it, it's such a simple mechanism but it explains everything and it's just like i mean that was the most um exciting thing i ever learned i guess yeah yeah the most exciting intellectual experience i've ever had was grasping darwin's theory of evolution yeah it's um, it's amazing like um C craig and i are we super interested in this stuff as well and um we were actually we were talking about it recently on one of our other podcasts um and there's a guy that uh, craig actually introduced me to him um uh, neil de tyson grasson have i got Degrass. the name right? neil, Degrass. Degrass. neil Degrass. Yeah, yeah there you are yeah. always always get those two names mixed up. <laughs> <laughs> um and he's got a great show on netflix um i think it's cosmos and um he talks about like humans evolving from trees basically you know over obviously billions and billions of years and it's just like wow mm -hmm. really fascinating when you when you take it that far back you know um yeah. 
such yeah. an interesting subject. Well, I, I when I was, um, you know, I think I was probably like 10 years old or even less because it was while we were still living in East London, I think the, the, the original Cosmos was broadcast on SABC. Wow. Oh, Sagan. Um, Carl Sagan, yeah, and geez, he was amazing. I mean, I've actually read a lot of his books. He's got some amazing books. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, you love but Carl he, Sagan, he, don't you, Craig? Yeah, but I mean, yeah. his, his, there's so many interesting stories around Cosmos, the original, but also with his, with his wife. Like, she was also like just an incredible woman, and some of the stuff that you know they they created this little package to send into space and they had to figure out yes like what would they put in this this box if an alien had to find it and this is super interesting man yeah do you listen to the podcast radio lab yes yeah yeah yeah. because 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 that's one of my favorite podcasts and i think on radio lab i think it was on radio lab there was a a whole interview with her where she describes how she met Carl Sagan. Oh, really? And wow. how they fell in how they how they fell in love, and it's just a really cool story. Yeah, yeah that sounds cool. powerful. Minds. Mm. What did they put in so, that box, Craig? Do you remember? Jeez, but I mean, it's super interesting. It's like uh, uh, like pictures of like anatomical pictures, and then music from variety of cultures um scientific like this real uh, they created this basically a scientific language that if someone had to find it it would like explain who we are where and where we are uh, and like they had mm. to come up with all this stuff and and how to you know had to conceptualize if uh, sort of first of all would an alien have a technology to be able to listen and watch these things so i mean it was really for its time it was, it was really amazing and uh, and they had to, it was quite a big project actually, but really interesting, man. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, definitely, uh, w- worth to watch the original cosmos, I think. Uh, and also then Neil yeah. deGrasse Tyson is really good as well. So yeah. Awesome stuff. Eh? Yeah. Cool, man. And, mm. uh, and, and I remember as well, interestingly enough, just thinking about the evolution. I remember when I was in first year university and they, we, we went into bio and they started talking about evolution. I can remember how, cause it was like, yeah, it was a mix of so many people and it was really awkward in the beginning for the lecturers because they were like you know we we have to teach the the controversy so to speak and uh yeah really really quite uh shocking how that how that still happens there eh? where were you at university i went to university of johannesburg and so um uh, okay so, yeah so there was just a yeah i don't know where, where, where were you uct all right so it was a bit different yeah. there, I would imagine. Yeah, they they definitely didn't have to teach the controversy. Mm. They just taught it taught us that this is what happened, and everybody yeah. agreed. <laughs> yeah, I know for yeah. sure. For sure. <laughs> well, what do you mean by controversy? Are you talking about like it's? What do you mean? Craig? Well, I think oh. for, for, for yeah. No, but I think you're saying basically they have to take into account people's religious sensitivities, and there is this yes. whole thing in America like. This, oh shit, there goes my phone. Let me just turn it off. Um, there is this um, this whole thing in America that they've created this idea that there is a controversy that 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 mm. that like you know that that, that um, I mean uh, there isn't actually a, a scientific contro- controversy about evolution, but they've created this idea that there is that. <laughs> There's some, you know, that there's an alternative theory that creationism is a, is a valid scientific theory that needs to be taught in schools, and because, um, I mean, America is so religious, yeah. I guess. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. It's... And they've managed managed to get these laws put in place that force people to yeah, teach just... the alternative theory as if it's a, as if it's something to teach people in science class. Anyway. Yes. Yeah. No, it's um... interesting though. Jeez. <laughs> The Bible Belt, as it's known, I guess. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but I mean, yeah. So, yeah. sorry, carry on. No, I mean re- religion. You know, I, I don't, I don't really knock religion because I just know that it's kind of the, how the human mind works. We need stuff to believe in. We, you know, being a human being is a very um, difficult thing. You know, um, mm. and I don't. I think whatever gets people through this world feeling okay, I, you know, I often wish that I didn't, I hadn't had my scientific education because I look at, 
people's the kind of euphoria that I see people getting out of religion. It's and, mm. I, and I wish I had access to that. I, I can't access the religious experience because I'm an atheist and my my intellect doesn't. It's rejected all the, you know, I've seen through the illusions in a way. Mm. Um, but I sometimes think that that's made my life a little bit harder. You know, it would have been easier if I could have just felt like saved, you know, and and all my troubles. I had someone someone in the sky that I could talk to about all my troubles instead of feeling you know, alone, <laughs> For sure. alone in the world. Okay. Yeah, but ignorance can be bliss, I guess, sometimes with certain things. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 And, but anyway, I yeah. guess music, music is music is my religion. So I, you know, I, I listen to music, and I think it gives it gives me what maybe what religion gives other people. And I do think that in a way, music is a kind of does serve like a a similar function to what the church would have served way back. You know, it brings people together. They they come together on a Saturday night to watch their bands, and that's like they get the For sense sure. of community that they would have got out of a church. Yeah. Um, yeah, totally. But I, I like I, I, uh, I'm the same as you. Like I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm not religious. Um, but I'm, I'm not gonna knock it at all. I'm very interested in people's thoughts on it. That's for sure. You always need to, you know, take everyone's thoughts into consideration. And I, I, I genuinely think, like deep down, it is just that sense of belonging, you know, and being part of something where other people believe in the same thing. They yeah. do. And, and it's, that's kind of really maybe what it is. And there's all this other stuff on top. That's, that's what, you know, f- fair enough. But, mm-hmm. um, it is nice to be yeah, surrounded by cool people that agree with stuff that you agree with, I guess, in a way. 100%. Yeah. No, I mean, when I was, when I was a teenager, I used to go to church, and I think the main reason was girls, you know. It's yeah. Like, <laughs> great way. And, and I think it's, you know, that's uh, religion is a lot about the social aspect. I agree with you absolutely. Yeah. And that's actually one thing that, that a lot of um, what they're calling these days new atheists and stuff are, they almost, uh, you know, they are saying that that's one thing that's missing from atheism is, uh, because it's, it's not a religion, it, 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 you don't have that uh, that sense of belonging as such, and and it would be nice in a way to have that uh, have that you know inverted mm-hmm. commas you know that that place to crutch to stand on or the, the 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 mateship that you get from from that in a secular uh, way, and um, but but how to do that is sort of is is the question. So. Yeah, it's a good question. It's a good. Yeah, and also point. I think I think one of the one of the things that 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 makes someone into an atheist in a way is the fact that they, not afraid to be alone in their thinking. Um, mm. I think to 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 see the truth that's out there, you need to be willing to be alone because I mean that's that's been my experience. You know, I've I've found myself very alone in what I think in my life, and I think if I'd been yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, maybe if I had a different kind of personality, I wouldn't have been able to think the way I think. Mm. And <laughs> I think people choose not to think in order to not be alone, you know, in order to just go mm. with the crowd. Totally, bud. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah, mm. yeah, for sure. 100%. So, mm. so yeah, um, Simon, um, just to give this a bit of context, um I heard an amazing song of yours, uh, Watermelons, on uh, Christopher Ryan's podcast, uh, and it blew me away. And I, I inst- like, I really mm. got such a good feeling from it, and uh, it it it, would, it just sort of touched me on some on some level. And um, and I thought, yes, I'd love to chat to you. And then, you know, um, I, I listened to the full podcast, obviously with with him, and uh, before that, the, the lot. The one that I listened to with that song was actually one of his recent podcasts, but he interviewed you a little while back. Um, oh, I'd love to it again. Okay, cool. Yeah, so that so that was it was really really cool. So um, I'd love to like find out uh, how, how you guys or how he got in touch with you and how that sort of relationship lost or, or, or came about and how you got onto a, uh, an international podcast um, and on his sort of intro soundtrack kind of thing. Mm. Uh, basically, I just got an email 
I don't know, it was about two years ago now, I think, or a year and a half, maybe. Um, I got an email when, so in fact, I'd, so he, his book, Sex at Dawn, I'd actually come across this book about a year or two previously, because mm. um, there's this great, there's this great um, blog called, uh, it's, 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 a, it's this blog that reviews books. Um, Goodreads or? Damn it. No, uh, it'll come to me just now. Um, anyway, I, I, I came across this book, and so I knew I knew about this book. You know, because mm -hmm. it was a bestseller. It, 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 it was everywhere. You know, a lot of people knew about it, but I hadn't actually read it. Yes. Um, and then I get this email, and it says, "Hi, my name is Chris Ryan, um, and I." Uh, wrote a book called Sex at Dawn and my mother's very proud of me and <laughs> being a bit funny. Um, and it, it means I'm now like get to sort of hang out with Hollywood celebrities and whatever. He was, he was quite funny in the email and he said anyway, and, um, and I'm like, geez, why is this guy emailing me? And uh, first thing I thought this must be a scam. Um, <laughs> and, and then he said, and, uh, I happened to be in Cape Town and a song of yours popped up on my iPod um, and I've got this podcast um, and you know would you like to come and be on my podcast and I was like wow you know that's cool, cool. so um, yeah so I went round to this place he was staying at in Newlands and took my guitar and we just hung out and chatted and um, it turns out he because he's a psychologist yeah um, mm -hmm. And he went to a conference in Israel, I think, in 2001. Um, and he shared, a, a, you know, his accommodation. He was he had a, a roommate where, wherever this conference was, who was from South Africa. And this guy had a CD of mine, and I it must have been <laughs> like just just after I um, yes. launched my, my very first album in 2001. I launched my first album. And um, he, got, you know, he gave the CD, or gave a copy or something to Chris Ryan, and um, he's Chris has been listening to my music ever since. Um, and I guess in Chris's mind, I was obviously just some like famous musician, um, <laughs> you know, like because he had the CD. You know, I must be must be well known, you know, and he's he just like, yeah. So it's so that, that was it. And um, I went on the show, and it's actually been very good for me. I've, it's generated quite a lot of um, sales, you know, online sales. Every every couple of days, I get an email from someone saying, "Hey, I heard your song on Chris, Chris Ryan's podcast." And yeah, but I put my CD. He he mm. would get tons and tons of downloads on his uh, on his podcast because, I mean, it's an amazing one. Like that's for sure. Ten tangentially speaking, hey. Um, yes. And uh, yeah, wow. I mean. I love listening to him. He's he's been an interesting guy and has a really uh, interesting take on the world. That's for sure, and um, and has yeah. a ridiculously interesting story as well, and um, has some very fascinating perspectives on life and you know things about, like you said, mm. evolution and sex and, and all these sort of things. And it's 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 really interesting. Yeah, his book is great. I, yeah. I then I then went and read his book. And it's a really cool book. Um, I don't know if you guys have read it. I haven't read it, but oh, I know I, I know, it, yes. I know of the book, and uh, yeah, like a few mates okay. have read it and stuff. And it's uh, it definitely, um, I think it's like probably an eye opener, but it also speaks a lot of truth about you know how humans are now compared yeah. to how we uh, how we actually are maybe supposed to be in a way. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah well, what, that's what I think. I, I mean, I I agree with what he says in the book, but it is a bit controversial. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because um, I mean, what? But, he, what, but he's very. Sorry, bad carry yeah. on. No. No, he's basically saying that um, human beings, the, the, how we naturally are, is not monogamous. Um, yeah. And. Um, our, uh, these ideas of, of monogamy come from religion, um, you know, from our culture. But the culture that 
came about after agriculture. So in pre-agricultural right. societies, we were in a we, we were very different in terms of our sexuality from how we are now. And it's the, the reason is culture; it's not our nature. And so everybody's behaving according to our culture, and it creates this huge conflict. So people get married, but they want to have sex with other people all the time, but they have to repress that, and it's mm. the reason so many marriages fail. Um, mm. Yeah, anyway. it's, it's very interesting, isn't yeah. it? Because, like, I mean, what he he talks about, like polyamorous. I think that's the word, like relationships. And there's there's a lot of guys that are talking about this now too. Like, you know, very well known guys that have you know big podcasts and run massive companies in, around the world, and they they talk about these things. And it's like, wow, okay. And they actually, you know, they engage in these sort of relationships themselves, and it's. Can, I mean, it's it's obviously a very personal thing for every single individual, and it's uh, it's a hard one to get your mind mind around, I guess, basically because I think we've it's a very got, uh, yeah yeah. I think I, I I don't think given how I was brought up in the culture I was raised in, I don't think it's that easy to just you know be that way. We mm -hmm. up against so much in terms of our culture and in in our own way of thinking of what's right and wrong that's you know deep in us that's not just something we can read a book and then flick a switch and be mm. like we were 20,000 years ago yeah um, I, I don't I don't know how easy easy it would be for us to just completely embrace that and for for the world to be fine and our, our lives to be fine I think I think we need yeah, I don't know. Partly because we grew up in these little family units. Yeah. I don't think we're actually. Um, so, so what I what I thought when I read that book is, back in the in the Stone Age or whenever, you. So so nobody was quite sure who your father was. Yeah. Because one woman would have several sexual partners around the time that she could have conceived. Mm. Um, and so the idea is there were maybe 10 men who had some kind of interest in you as possibly being their offspring. And mm. at the same time, you lived in these, in these small groups of like 50 to 100 people. And there were, there were so many potential mothers or babysitters around so a child never felt abandoned or alone. There were always all these adults. Like, so so think about the modern family. If you've got two parents and they're having a fight and they're not talking to each other for weeks or whatever. Yeah. Mm. And that tension in the house. The child's got nowhere to go, and yes. that all that all that shit just gets dumped on the child in a way, and that's what screws mm. up children. Yeah. Whereas in in Stone Age communities, you didn't have that kind of situation, and I think people grew up with a much better developed kind of unconscious and sense of self and um, just sense of, of security in the world. And I think because we don't have that, that deep sense of security, we grow up looking for one person who's going to make our lives okay again. And then we, hmm. we get locked into another little family unit and the cycle continues. And I think that's like a big problem in the world. And that's maybe... I mean, I'm speaking partly from my own experience because I know that my parents, when I was a, an infant, things weren't blacker in the house, you know, and my mother mm. was at postnatal depression. And I think that that's the reason I struggle with depression in my life is because I didn't get a certain thing that, that maybe 20,000 years ago would have just been there in abundance, you know. Yeah. When, and I think that that's like the root of all this loneliness and alienation that's so many people are experiencing in the world is these little family units where you you're lucky if you've got like brothers and sisters you can play with but a lot of people just um they end up end up feeling very alone in their little ch childhoods you know mm. yes I, anyway, so take us back take I, us back there when, out. when you were a kid was that was that how you felt a lot of the time when you were when you were youngster is is alone and and you, you had a brother or have a brother? Yeah, no, look, um, I have a brother, yeah, but did you and, have I, and, I, and a lot I had. Of that? Yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of hard for me to remember it, um, but 
I do have memories of feeling very abandoned, you know, and um, and what I've managed to piece together through seeing therapists is that um, my mother, who, you know, I love my mother and I totally understand why she would have been the way she was when I was a child because she had her own childhood experience you know, probably it's probably stuff that comes from the Boer War. You know, like mm. things were hectic in my grandmother's time and her grandmother's time, and yeah. and 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 whatever. But when I was a child, my um, my anger, for example. So so when a, when a child feels angry, which is a perfectly normal reaction to an unmet need, mm. a child will throw a tantrum. A good mother will pick the child up and 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 allow that child to show its anger at the mother. Like you've you've probably seen like a child saying to its mother, "I hate you," <laughs> and the mother either either laughs and picks up the child and or, or like is offended and tries to discipline the child and say, "You never say stuff like that," and then sends the child to its room. Now those two situations are very a very different. It could have a very different um, effect on the psychological development yeah. of the child, and I think, I think my not that not that that specific scenario would have happened when I was a child necessarily, but I think my anger was there was no place for it in my house, and I and I probably learnt without even realizing that that in order to survive and get the love I needed, I had to completely bury my anger. Um, and when you do that, what you end up with is a depressed adult because you've got an unconscious mechanism that pushes anger away. Yeah. Um, and then what happens to that anger is it just goes back inside and makes you feel like you're the, you're the one who's wrong instead of putting the anger where it belongs. So, um, <laughs> yeah. So you wanted to go deep. That's, just, that's, that's where it goes. Yeah. That's good, that's good stuff. Yeah. And, and so, so like you said your relationship now with your with your mom you know you still she's still around i take it and you you know you still see her what about yeah, what about your old man uh he died a few years ago but um he he was much more kind of emotionally accessible like he, he liked to talk about stuff you see this is the thing it's very hard for me to, to go to my mother to this day to go to her and say mom i'm feeling depressed i'm really struggling with certain things it's just never been how it has been with with my mother. And I guess it wasn't really like that with my dad either very much when I was growing up. So hence my turning to music for for the emotional stuff. Um, but I guess when my dad, in his old age, he kind of mellowed and, and I used to have really nice, real chats with him about all the stuff that I do struggle with. And he was... He was very, yeah, you know, very nice about everything, and um, but also he came from a time, you know, they didn't go to therapy, that, you know, that yeah. generation. There was no, there was no, um, it wasn't an option, and and you know, I mean, I I keep feeling like I should go to my mother and say, Mom, you really need to go to therapy, but I can see it's just going to turn into a horrible fight, and and mm. she's just going to be maybe just really offended that I think that or something. So mm. um, even though I really think it would make it would improve the quality of her life, you know, what's left of it. So, yeah. yeah. It's but interesting how, I suppose we you all just, have it. yeah, it, it's tough, you know, to, we were speaking about it earlier when you set in your ways and you have your beliefs and sometimes stiff up a lip and harden up is, is your belief. And, or for example, I'm not saying that's what, what she believed, but if it is something to that effect, then it's very hard to say, open up and be vulnerable and, and talk to others no, about your, you know. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I've got that inside me too because I was brought up in that environment and, you know, I, that's been part of my battle is to to learn that it's okay to, to and I suppose music taught me that, you know, like that's, that's what, what I loved about Neil Young and Paul Simon and the songs I used to listen to when I was a teenager. That it was all about the sensitive side of, of being a human being. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I totally relate to my mother's way of thinking, but I've also been fortunate enough to have been shown another way of thinking 
Um, yeah, I mean, I don't, yeah, yeah. I don't know and, what else and, to say about that. And, and so, so your your kind of journey with music, like you you now you just mentioned Neil Young and Paul Simon, like how how did that sort of uh, evolve and uh, even sort of come up in the first place? Um, so Paul Simon, when I was, okay, so when I was in high school, all the music that at the parties was like, you know, Depeche Mode, this is the 80s, <laughs> um, Spandau Ballet, Thompson Twins, um, yeah, there was the police, which I, which were pretty cool. There was Dire Straits, which I dug. Yeah, um, yeah. But, but but most of the music I couldn't really relate to so well. Um, I don't know. I just found it for some reason it didn't didn't feed me. And I used to go to parties and I just sort of end up in the kitchen talking to whoever it was, his mother or whatever. You know, I didn't like really <laughs> connect with the with the vibe on the dance floor so well. Um, but then my brother um, had a, we used to play hockey in high school and he had a hockey party at the end of the year and the hockey, yeah. um, the hockey, the hockey coach brought along this video. This is like back in the days of VHS videos and we had a video, <laughs> video machine and at, uh, after the bra, he put the video on and it was, it was, um, Simon and Garfunkel live in Central Park, uh. which I think that concert must have happened in 1984 or something. Yeah, uh, or might have, it might have been a bit earlier, but it was this amazing thing, and I'd never really, I didn't really know their music at all, and it was just, I just like was completely gripped by these songs, which, which were speaking a completely different language to me from the 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 songs that I was hearing at at parties in high school, um, mm. and so then. At about that time, my, my cousin, who I was best friends with, had said to me, we should get guitars, you know, like, <laughs> it would be luck if we can, you know, sing, sing, sing at Briars and things, and it will be a good way to impress girls. And so we both went <laughs> off and bought guitars. And, um, and we, and then, and then my parents gave me the Paul Simon complete songbook for my birthday. And, and it had these little pictures of the chords above the words. And so I learned, the, basically <laughs> learned to play the guitar from this book. Um, and me and my cousin Joe would go and sing like sliding away and the boxer and whatever, you know, harmonizing, um, you know, he, he also had a, a nice voice and it was great. And my cousin Joe eventually, you know, sort of stopped playing the guitar, but for me, it became like a very necessary thing in my life. I'd come home from school and I just pick up a guitar and sit for an hour or two singing these Simon and Garfunkel songs. I just loved it. And then, um, and then I had a holiday job one December, um, and the guy I was working for it was this laboratory where he made these little plants. It was this, it, was, it was a bit of a fad. You, you got these little glass bottles, and they had a bit of nutrient gel in the bottom, and then there would be a yeah. little cloned orchid. I don't know if you remember them, and the, the little yeah. plant would grow in the bottle, and it was a baby, and it was the whole thing with adopt a baby orchid, orchid, and he had this <laughs> business making these orchids, and I used to go, I used to, used to go to his lab and stick stickers on the bottles, and he had, he was also a DJ, and he had all these tapes lying around, and I've just picked up this one tape and put it in a tape recorder and and pushed play, and it was actually Neil Young's very first album, um, and the minute I heard this voice, it just like went straight yes. through into the middle of me. It was just like, mm -hmm. wow, like, who is this? Um, and I just had to get hold of all of his music. And I, and then I started singing his songs. Um, and then, then I got into Bob Dylan and just became obsessed with Bob Dylan for a year <laughs> or so. Um, and so by the time I was like about 20 years old or 21, I probably had about 200 songs that I could just play off by yes. heart, you know, that I just, wow. because I just sat played songs so much and I used to like end up at, at, at any kind of, when I was a student, any kind of like braai or party, I'd have, my, I, I'd never went anywhere without my guitar and people always begged me to sing and I'd sing and everyone loved it. And then um, one day I was, 
I was staying in a digs in in uh, Rosebank, and there's a there's a little subway under the railway line, and I was walking through the subway with my guitar, and I came across this other guy who had a guitar, and we like, were, hey, how's it? You play the guitar, <laughs> you know? Um, and this guy's name was Ben, and um, he he lived around the corner, so we eventually started hanging out, and and Ben had written a whole bunch of songs. And they were really good songs. I was like, oh, my goodness, this guy's a genius. You know, it's, wow. I was completely blown away by his songs. Um, so I said, yeah, OK, I've also got this one song I wrote. And I played it for him. Um, and he was like, wow, that's really cool. And he was excited about my song. And I suddenly realized, hey, I can write songs. You know, I, I thought that <laughs> song I wrote was, was, was terrible, but Ben thinks it's cool. So then... And I just started writing songs and I'd play them to Ben and we'd formed a band and we'd play our songs and and I realized that people liked my songs. It was, um, I suppose, because I knew the secret of of um, putting feelings into songs because I'd been taught it by Neil Young and Paul Simon and Bob Dylan yes. how, to, yeah. how, to, how to take your deepest feelings and just like... When you when you sing a melody that's that's rich in those feelings, that melody becomes beautiful, you know. So it's not just a matter of thinking what's a clever melody. It's like the melody has to be fueled by your feelings, and then it becomes this magical thing that can make other people feel something. Um, and yeah, so then I wrote songs, and um, it was about nineteen ninety or something 93 maybe um, and then in 2001 I recorded an album of the best of all the songs I'd written up to that point um, what, yeah. what, what just, sort of things were you yeah. writing about like in the early days um, about how flipping lonely and alienated I felt a lot of it you know and just about um, yeah, I mean, I was struggling with depression, you know, I was really not finding a way to be happy in the world. And, and music was where I could make something good out of what felt like a completely useless state of being, you know, I, I felt like my life was just useless. I was depressed and I couldn't like, couldn't. I just couldn't find a way to feel like I was a valuable human being. But if I took that very feeling and turned it into a song, it became something valuable, you know? Yeah. So that's the, that's the amazing thing about songwriting. You can, you can take something that, that, that feels like a complete waste of your energy, like this, all this stuff that just churns inside of you and you doesn't, you don't feel like it's going anywhere and it's just, you stuck in yourself and then you can write about that and it becomes something beautiful and um, and something that can maybe help other people who are struggling with that thing, you know. So, sure. Yeah, I guess I just I just wrote about you know I mean I generally try not to be too prescriptive or try and put any kind of particular philosophy or message into my songs. I don't I don't really think a good song is something that's preaching or you know trying to tell people how to think mm -hmm. but so what i do what i try and do when i write songs is not let my mind get too much in the way of what my unconscious is just trying to let out so i quite like the idea of, of songs that don't really make sense from a intellectual or rational point of view but that make you feel a lot yeah so some of my, you know like if you look at a lot of bob dylan's lyrics a lot of them like they don't really make any sense you know like crimson mm. flames tied through my ears blowing high and mighty traps um <laughs> what does that mean but it but it's <laughs> full of like some energy that you just love you know yeah um, yeah. and, and that's the secret for me is to, to just let it's a good song for me is almost like a dream. You know, you, you wake up in the morning from a dream and you think, gee, that is weird. It didn't make any sense, 
but you felt a lot during the dream and it like oh, it, yeah. it, 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 it's almost like something shifted in you because of the dream maybe you know for sure and so your so, so your music is serving two am i right in saying your music is serving two th- yourself in two ways like first of all as a way of like putting your thoughts into sort of a a way that you can sort of look at them separate from yourself and and have a think about that and then also in a way of thinking well maybe this might help others if they felt the same way they might get that same sort of uh comfort that i got from listening to neil young for example yeah i mean that's definitely what inspired me in the first place to want to write songs was to do for other people what neil young did for me but also to do for myself what neil young did for me you know so it's both Mm. it's like but but i don't think a song is going to be any good to anyone else if it's not good to me you know i I think that the only honest way to write a song is to write exactly what I know and experience. I, I don't believe I should write a song, um, say, about the political situation in South Africa. If that's not something that I'm really angry about or feeling really strongly about in that, at, in that moment. So the things that consume me are my own internal struggles, and that's what I write about because anything else would be slightly dishonest. You know, I did, I mean, I did this little online songwriting course and learned a whole method of writing songs, and I did dabble in this kind of thing of, so I've got one song on my last album called The Google Song, which is all about, you know, the internet and and, and, and how it's affecting me. But again, it comes back to me. Um, and I do kind of think maybe I need to start pushing myself more in the direction of, looking around at the world and you know doing some social commentary type of songs um Mm. because i think people definitely value that you know people uh, whenever i play the google song at gigs i always get this like nice response and this like laughing it's sort of people recognizing themselves in it and it definitely people value it but i don't know for me personally the songs that are most valuable of other artists are the ones that speak honestly about their pain really and um this their struggling their struggles it's almost like a type of storytelling in a way isn't it you know you're just saying what you think and what affects you and um i I think people love stories and they can really associate with that and that's what brings out the emotion like you said yeah these are stories of the kind that you would come across in a dream Rather than the stories that you would come across in a in a in the newspaper or in a in a, a novel, say you know, I mean I've always admired like you know um, Bruce Springsteen's like The River, you know, mm. that song is tells tells this epic story of a of a life, you know, in a way in a very condensed form. But it's that's that's I love songs like that. And, uh, there's part of me that just thinks I should really get it together to write that kind of song. But right now, the honest thing for me to do is to write the song that expresses me, you know, what I'm going through personally. And, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I I sometimes wonder if I wouldn't reach a bigger market if I made it less personal and and maybe develop more of a persona that, like, I show to the world rather than this unfiltered version of myself. Yeah. (laughs) Like, yeah, it's, it's always hard to know that, isn't it? And um, yeah, I just yeah, uh, uh, yeah. Who knows? Um, but but just one thing. So like, you 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 said like a lot of this uh, the the songs and the lyrics and stuff uh, manifested, I guess, from you not feeling like you had, I guess, any sort of purpose or belonging or something in life. Like, how, where did that all come from, though? How, how I mean, I know you spoke about your mom and stuff, but was there? Was was it all to do with that, or was there other things too? No, I, I, it's very hard to know. From what I can figure out, it has its roots in your early childhood experience. You know, um, you either get instilled with a sense of your own value, or you don't. And I think everybody does is somewhere on that spectrum of feeling like they're really valuable, or feeling like they're worthless. And that is essentially what I think what everybody is struggling with on some level. Um, mm. If you feel if you feel if you just walk around with a sense of I'm really lovable, I'm really valuable, 
you're going to find love in the world and you're going to feel good about yourself and you're going to be inspired and productive and get lots of great stuff done. But if you're, you know, you were between the age of like, or between from when you're born till about the age of three, I mean, look at the size of a, of a newborn's baby, baby's head compared with the size of a three-year-old's head. It's quite amazing how that brain like triples in size. Mm. I don't know what what the scientific <laughs> amount actually is that it grows, but but it's a your brain is growing, and then it and then it more or less like you get your head gets to a certain size, and it grows a little bit more as you get to, to an adult. But most of it happens between zero and three years old, and whatever you're experiencing in that time is getting hardwired into this growing brain. Those like neural pathways are getting you know forged, and so. If you if the, if if your like experience in those first three years is like I'm not cool I'm not I'm not loved or whatever, and of course I was loved but it was a very mixed bag and it was there were mixed messages and you know uh, yeah. as a child I was loved for being clever but I wasn't loved for being angry or for being sad or you know and I think mm. if if you if you um, are made to feel as an infant that every emotion you have is all right, then you're going to grow up not feeling ashamed of anything you feel. But if you grow, if you have the opposite, then you grow up. So how I was when I came out of my teenage years was I was feeling this sort of sadness and, and, and I felt terribly ashamed of the fact that I was sad. I was feeling depressed and feeling terribly ashamed of being depressed. Why should one feel ashamed of being depressed, you know, or yeah. sad? Like, that's something that I was was programmed into me. It's not, except I didn't understand that it was programmed into me, and I just thought, obviously, I'm somehow just weak or lazy or bad, you know. And so that just feeds mm-hmm. into that thing, and you go around feeling like you're crap. Um, but the so yeah, I think the only way out of that is to get a proper understanding of of what went on in those first three years. And it's very hard because you didn't have words yet. You were only learning to speak. So, so you can't really remember it and you, it's mm-hmm. pre-verbal. You can't, you can't really think about it. And most of those early memories are in, inaccessible to us. I mean, I think the earliest mm-hmm. memory is from when I was about three, you know. Um, and that is a memory of my mother crying, you know. So Jeez. what does that tell me? Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty rough. And, but you uh, know Simon sorry sorry go no you go ahead Craig go ahead buddy no I was gonna say so like is this something like that still you find is is um a, a part of your life like but but smaller like do you still struggle with it and and also along this journey besides uh, using music as your kind of medicine did you ever have to go on any sort of prescription or anything like that or I tried antidepressants, but they didn't really do anything for me. Um, the only thing that's helped me is therapy, really. Um, and yeah, it's, it's still very much something I struggle with. Um, I see a therapist once a week, and um, it's definitely helping. I, I've I finally found... See, I, in the past, this is the first time I've seen a male therapist, and I always saw um, all my previous therapists were women. And the thing is... I would always get what I wanted from them, which was this kind of mothering, which made me feel okay. Mm. And then I started seeing this male therapist and because I couldn't get that mothering from him, I just, that's just not how my mind was. You know, I I didn't, I couldn't just project the mother onto him so Mm. easily. So Mm. um, instead I found myself feeling really angry with him because I I thought like I'm paying you this money, but you don't seem to be making me feel soothed, you know, like you're a shit therapist. And I just started feeling really angry with him. And he pointed out that this anger is what it's actually all about. Um, wow. And I, he, he, he made me realize how fucking angry I am without fear of it. Mm. I'd, never, I'd never realized how angry I was. And now I know because I've experienced it in that room with him. And he's, he, he tells me, you know, I'm actually the, he's the first person that I've ever been able to show my anger to because it's always in my little 
unconscious child's way of seeing. It's always be, it, it became far too risky to show anger. And I learned that so young that anger will destroy relationships. And so the anger just got bottled up. And now, because I can sit in a room with a guy once a week and, and be angry at him, the anger becomes alive in my in my mind and it starts to get processed. And as that happens, I become less depressed and wow. less ashamed. And, and it's definitely giving me energy, you know. I mean, the, 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 yeah, I'm getting shit done that I never got done before. That's, that's for sure, you know. My life is definitely Beautiful. getting better. But it's still not, I'm still not free of this, this stuff. Uh, I think I always have it on some level. In the beginning, yeah. when you decided I'm going to see a, a therapist, was that a sort of a decision that you just felt you just knew it was the right thing to do, or was how did you come to that point? In the where beginning, you decided, okay, uh, no, it kind of I first saw a therapist. I think it was quite soon after university, and I'd, I had friends at university who were studying psychology, and they could see what was going on with me and mm. they basically said you know you are a very good candidate for therapy you someone who who should right. see a therapist um and it took me a while to get my head around that like oh you know what does this mean about me am i like such a fuck up that you think i need therapy and whatever but i got over that and i started seeing a therapist and and um yeah i definitely am someone who needed therapy and i'm very glad that that I was shown that because I think a lot of people never get they don't they're not lucky enough to have friends who, who can who can point that out to them. That certainly don't have parents who are going to point it out to them because their parents are the people that made them need therapy and their parents think they're you know most people's no I can't say most people but I think a lot of people's parents are just from that generation that therapy was considered a weakness and I know yeah. I mean a lot of people my age my age friends of mine are you know they say oh yeah. therapy just becomes a, depend a dependence you got to stay away from that stuff you get in there you never get out and it's like i don't know i mean either i think you, you get if you need it you get what you need and um, once you stop needing it you'll stop going you know i don't think it's a dependence um yeah that's uh it's anyway. it's, it's it's very um it's just, it's so interesting like just listening to the the part especially about the having woman uh, therapist versus guy therapist and and just the different way that they sort of uh, treated you and, and what they're getting out and what the guys now getting out of you and 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 it's interesting just listening to a kind of tone of voice when you when you talk about him it, like it almost like your voice kind of lifts up um and <laughs> right. yeah yeah and and that's really it's really interesting um and and do you find that you're more angry, like maybe in your songwriting now, or even in the way you are as well. Like just to sort of really flash it out. Is is that something that you've noticed? I, um, you know, it's funny because anger. What most people think of anger is what you see when when someone loses their temper. Mm. And to me, that's actually when someone, the people who have anger issues, who tend to blow up, are people who who haven't really processed their anger and they're not really that in touch with their anger. When you're in touch with your anger, it's just a kind of a, a foundational energy that's there all the time that give, it gives you strength in a way. But, I mean, I see this with my brother because he's got shitloads of unprocessed anger. He's never been to therapy as far as I know. Mm. Um, and with my mother, my brother keeps blowing up. He keeps mm. just like getting outrageously angry with my mother. Whereas I'm, I know I'm angry with my mother. I've been angry with my mother for a long time and I've processed a lot of that anger with, with my mother. So when I'm with my mother, I'm patient and understanding and I don't blow up, even though I feel fucking angry. Mm. Mm. But so mm. I guess what I'm saying is I'm not going to necessarily pick up my guitar and f write like a furious song. But that energy is definitely in my music more than it used to be. Um, and it might come out as joy because when you can't feel your anger, you can't feel your joy either. You know, it's like when, 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 when one emotion is, is 
because your, all your emotions are, are like tied together. So if you're repressing one, you're actually going to repress them all to a degree. Um, it's yeah. So that's why for me personally, getting getting my anger out in therapy is just the key to everything actually. So yeah, I'm processing my anger and it's just energizing my general emotional world, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yes, that's cool. It's it's amazing what, what an impact uh talking can just have and just being vulnerable and just being able to talk to someone about it. Uh, I, I just think it's so important and that's part of the reason why we, we do this is this podcast mm. is just because, you know, just a platform for people to speak their truth and that allows someone else to reciprocate as well. And it's, it's really like a special thing, but um, people in general can have a really good influence on you. And I, I know there's a story, Simon, where, You'd you'd done some teaching in Italy and and you'd found a, um, a a woman that you sort of befriended or befriended you and and became a somewhat of a uh, sort of sort of a pivotal p point in your in your life's development and stuff. Can, can tell us a little bit a bit more about that the journey in in Italy. Okay, no, so so that actually started in Cape Town. Um, I was right. seeing a therapist at the time, and the therapist said to me, you know, I was just really depressed, and she said, you really need to get out of the house every day, because I was trying to be a web designer and write songs, and basically didn't have a job that I was going out and doing every day. Um, and she said, you need to get out of the house and interact with people, because that feedback you get through working in an environment where you're interacting with people is very important for anybody. Um and so I said, okay, well, I, I had experience teaching English. Um, uh, let me see if there are any language schools in Cape Town that need me. So I sent off my CV to a bunch of language schools, and I got a reply from this one language school who said basically they got this Italian woman who's um, in, in wow. Cape Town for six, for six weeks, and she wants one-on-one -on -one private tuition with an English teacher for six hours every day. Jeez. So I said, cool, I'll come and do it. And and, um, and so I got put in a class with this, with this woman. She's about 20 years older than me. Um, and I said, so, you know, what do you, what do you, what's your job? And she said, well, I'm a doctor. So I said, oh, what kind of doctor? She said, well, actually a psychoanalyst, because to be a psychoanalyst, I think you had to do medicine first and then specialize or something. Anyway. So um, I said, wow, you know, because for me, like, obviously, with all my struggling with my own head, this was like the high priestess, you know, she, <laughs> these psychoanalysts, like, they, they, they've gone very deep into all this stuff. Um, so I, I straight away knew that everything that I was ashamed of, I didn't have to feel ashamed of in front of this person because she knew, she understood it, she, that was her job. Um, and so I completely trusted her straight away. And maybe it is more, maybe it is more than, than the fact that she was a psychoanalyst. It could have just been something about her being that kind of person. But for whatever reason, um, I completely just like was open with her and she responded because I think she could straight away see what was going on with me and what my issues were, you know. And so... You know, we, we, we did. I, I was a teacher and I, we, I taught her English, but at the same time, we did a lot of what they call conversation class, which is like mm. the fun part of being an English teacher where you just chat with the class. And so her and I would just <laughs> chat. And, and a lot of it was, was kind of like having psychoanalysis. And she, you know, I would, I would I'd write my dreams down for her and, you know, she would interpret my dreams for me, which was amazing. Mm. And, and it was just like an amazing education in what was, what was actually going on in my subconscious. Um, yeah, and so then, in a way, also, what because she recognized this this thing of me having not got this very important thing that I needed as an infant from my mother, and she was able to offer that kind of understanding. And, and uh, you can call it love, though it's a tricky word, because immediately there's all this, like, the way the world's going to see, oh, this, this, you know, this... 30 year old guy and his 50 year old woman are just spending all their time together and like, hey, hey what's going on there, you know? Mm. But in fact, there was a very clear, like, 
boundary that, that was not what it was about. There was absolutely no sexual vibe. It was like it was like she was a mother to me. Um, mm. And when she when when her stay ended, she gave me an envelope with money in it for an air ticket and said, "Come and stay with my family." So I went over to Italy and spent right. three months staying with her with her and her husband and her and her son, who also lived in the house. He was a doctor. Because these Italian kids don't move out until they get married. So he was like 30 <laughs> and still living at home. Um, and yeah, and it was amazing. And it, it really did restore something to me. Um, I came out of that experience. Uh, so, and what also happened, so, you know, I've been writing these songs, but not having the kind of sense of belief in, in my songwriting to to ever record anything. And um, when, I, when I arrived in Italy, she, she, uh, her and her daughter picked me up from the air, airport, and we went to this um, this restaurant where she said there's this woman who sings. So there was a setup with a guitar and stuff. And um, during the break, um, I went up and sang some songs. And it turned out the guy, this, the woman who who sang, her husband who ran the restaurant was a bit of a music producer, and he was very interested in my songs. And um, I actually did do a couple of recordings in his studio and he was talking about like a record oh, cool. deal and all the stuff. But at the same time, none of that ever actually happened because it got a bit complicated. My visa, I had a visa for three months and it expired and I would have had to have come back and it, it just got very complicated. Um, yeah. But while I was there, I um, bought a little mixing desk and I had my computer there um, and I had, I'd taken my computer and microphone over um, and I just set up in a bedroom in this house and sang all my songs into the computer through this nice microphone. And um, that became my first album. You know, I just brought that I brought that CD back to Cape Town Jeez. and played it to friends and they just loved it. And, and so I then went back to my friend Ben, the guy who I met in the subway all those years ago. Mm. And he, he was now producing music a bit. So we took those recordings and added some instrumentation um, and that became my first album. And then, um, yeah, so then I was back in Cape Town, um, released my first album, and then this, my second album, there was this guy who I'd known for years called Dave, who was a, you know, he was a producer, and he said to me, Simon, we really got to get these songs of yours produced properly, you know, because that was very much a home recording. Um, so we talked about making an album and we got together with my bass player, Eric. Um, and there was this drummer that we'd sort of been jamming with and he was very, a very nice young drummer. And we started doing some pre-production sessions. In the, and, and Dave, this producer, had very fixed ideas on what the drums should sound like. And this drummer just wasn't interested in being told what to do and he quit the band. <laughs> so now we just suddenly, suddenly didn't have a drummer and... and uh, we were thinking, who's a good drummer? And and Ross Campbell is who's now my drummer. Was this drummer who I'd always just like thought was the coolest drummer around. Um, he, uh -huh. you know, he, he he back in the I don't know if you guys know the music scene in the '90s, but there's um, Celtic Rumors was this band that was quite a thing, and he and he played drums for them when he was like 18. They had a number one on Five FM hmm. or Radio Five in those days. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and, and you know he played in in, in uh, Urban Creep, which were uh, yeah. pretty big in the yeah. night. So so and then and then Benguela, which is this very kind of uh, improvisational, very cool like underground band that I'd I'd seen a few times and just thought, shit, this guy's I love this guy's drumming. And wow. so, but I always thought I always thought no, he's much too good to be my drummer. You know, he won't want to drum with us. Um, and Eric, who's my bass player, said, said, what about Ross Campbell? And so Dave, the producer, said, yeah, I know, um, Ross owes me a favor. I'll, I'll, I'll get hold of Ross. <laughs> and so so Dave got Ross to come around, and Ross jammed with us and obviously liked the songs because he's been jamming with us ever since, you know, so we yeah. made that album. <laughs> And, and then because Ross had all these music industry connections, we got a record deal for the third album, and we flew to Joburg and recorded with this guy, Joe Arthur, who'd done the Freshly Ground albums, and got a very nice recording out of that. 
Um, uh, but I don't think that, you know, the, the, the guy from the record label didn't really know how to market us because he was, you know, so his other act was this guy, Farrell Perkis, who was trying to like market as like the new Jack Johnson from South Africa. Um, and I think he wanted us to be like that kind of thing, you know, sort of Jack Johnson vibe, you know, mm. which we, which we are, but we're not, you know, the, the subject matter yeah. and the, the, the sort of where the music's coming from is a completely different thing. And I think actually, I think our music is kind of, kind of hard to put it in a box, you know, and, and anyway, so he, his focus was Australia and he took this music to Australia and he couldn't actually find anyone to like sign us up there. And eventually he didn't really spend any money on us and didn't promote us. And, and so we, so we then this guy from Dubai, this guy called Steve, who runs this company called Jump Media, heard heard that album while he was touring the Winelands with a friend in Cape Town. Mm-hmm. You know, and this this friend just put put our third CD in the car and they were driving. And Steve said, "Shit, what is this music? Who's this band?" And the guy said, "No, this is a Cape Town band." He said, "Well, I want to meet them." And so he <laughs> he met up met up with us and said, "We're going to get out of our record deal, and he's gonna he's gonna pay for our next album." And he immediately flew us to Dubai to go and be the support act for um, Finley Quay, wow. which we did this this yeah. gig on the gig on the, roo- on the roof of the of the Radisson Hotel in Dubai. Wow. Um, yeah, and then and then we you know we needed we, we so our fourth album we needed a producer and we'd always liked the guy the, this is an album by Angus and Julia Stone. Mm. Um, this is this it's of theirs called Chocolates and Cigarettes, and we loved mm. the production on that. So we we got hold of the guy who produced that album and Steve from Dubai paid to fly him over to Cape Town and we recorded our fourth album oh, here cool. in Cape Town with that guy. Um, and then the financial crisis and Dubai just went, the, the money became an issue in Dubai. Suddenly like Dubai was booming and suddenly it wasn't booming and Steve was suddenly like wor- worried about money. So he kind of had to pull out of the whole thing, but he said, you guys can just have the album. Um, so that is our fourth album. And then my fifth album, I, I did this project where I wrote a song every week for a year. I just like set myself this goal. Uh, and the trick with that is, you know, you go public with it. So you just like tell everyone on Facebook <laughs> and Twitter, whatever. <laughs> it's going to do this thing. And then if you don't do it, you're going to look bad. So that is how I made sure I did it. And every week I had to write a song and post it online. <laughs> and it worked really well at the, you know, at the end of the, the year. I had 52 songs and we could just handpick the best for the album. And so we ended up with an album where I was actually like every single song I'm completely happy with because I didn't have to put <laughs> any of the ones that I wasn't sure of. Um, and I paid for that album myself. We produced that in Cape Town. Um, so now, yeah, now we don't have anyone backing us, um, and we need to make another album, and we're just trying to figure out how to do that. Because um, I, because I did the yeah. whole song a week thing again last year. I wrote another 52 songs last year, so I've got all these songs now that we need to make a new album out of. Wow, mm. bud, it's it's a such a cool journey, here, isn't it? Just listening to all those things that happened. It's. Um, but it also like highlights how sort of tough it is to be a musician. You know, it's not like it's not easy at all. And, you know, like to make a breakthrough, I can imagine is flipping hard. There's just so much. You, there's so much you're competing against. And, uh, you know, the spoils go to a very small mm. fraction mm. of those who in the market. You know, it's like, yeah, I mean, when you when when you think I want to be a musician, you're inspired by these people who are successful, but you forget that they're like 0.01 or even less, 0.001% of all the musicians who are trying to be musicians. Yeah. So a tiny fraction actually make it, you know, and then a slightly bigger fraction make a living out of it. And then, you know, most musicians have day jobs. Um, yeah. And I guess, yeah. you know, so I have a day job. I don't, I don't really need to make a living off my music, but I really would like to not be doing my day job and just be out there giving, I, I want to be delivering my music to the world. I think like there, there are a lot of people out there who like you guys, you know, if it hadn't been for that podcast, you wouldn't have heard my songs and the people, there, there are mi- probably millions of people just like you out there who would hear my song and go, wow, I'm glad I heard that song, Yeah. but they're not going to yeah. hear it because 
because I'm not out there enough and how do I get out there enough and that's the challenge for me is figuring that out but it's also got a lot to do with you know if you if you're someone who who is who has been depressed for a long time and it's and now now I'm coming out of it because I found a therapist who's helping me get out of it but you know it's hard to to succeed as a musician if you don't believe in yourself because mm. you get up on a stage you've got to convince the audience part, part of it is about convincing the audience yes. by believing in yourself by standing there you know and that's often the make or break factor in a cutthroat business like the music industry. Yes. If you if you if you don't like really believe in yourself, you're gonna. There'll be there'll be like, so you stand up on a stage. There'll be maybe ten percent of the audience who 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 no matter how much self doubt you've got, they're gonna get what your music's about. Yeah. Because they yeah. sensitive, intelligent people. They don't mind that you don't believe in yourself. They get it. Yeah. But there's there's another fifty percent of the audience who would love your music if you could convince them to love your music. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. if I yeah. get up there and I just like fucking give it to them and don't like feel any self consciousness or self doubt and I'm just like, fuck you all, here's my music, I'm singing it to you. They almost respect yeah. that more than someone who's like, sorry, like I'm a bit embarrassed, but here's my song, you know? Yeah, yeah totally. So yeah. that's totally. That, that's how the music industry works. And I guess up till now I've been that guy going getting up there going, Oh, sorry, like I'm a bit like depressed, but I'm singing songs for you anyway. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, yes. Uh, and and uh, that's shifting for me now. So hopefully going forward with yes. you know with the therapy doing what it's doing for me that's going to get better and better that's oh, so cool i think you know it's uh, you know, i like what you say it's it's just those there's a 10 percent get it and then the others don't but i think that's with, with so many things in life it's the sometimes the person that shouts the loudest gets heard and then and then people cotton on to that and mm. then suddenly they are oh wow they you know, they're either expert or whatever it is in whatever field it is. And, but it's just because they, they shouted the loudest. It's not necessarily no, well, that that's they are the, actually that's the best. That's the problem. That's the problem. That's why there's so much shit art in the world because there's two kinds of people, introverts and extroverts. And often the best artists are introverts, mm. but the people whose art gets out there are the extroverts. So as a result, like Hollywood is full of shit movies because those are the people who are good at networking. Hmm. And it's the same in the music yeah. industry. You know, there's just so much crap music that that because people are good at networking and using and and uh, yeah, their music gets gets yeah. to dominate. Yes, it's, it's, it's one of the reasons why I it, one of the reasons why I don't like why I love advocating not just listening to like pop music because you know there's so much good music out there, like amazing music that. You've got to like dig and you've got to scratch and you've got to, you know, Absolutely. you've got to look in the in the dark places or the the not just in the light and and you'll find yeah. these amazing gems. And and yeah. often it's just the music that you'll hear is just for the is just purely because they shouted the loudest. And it's and, and that's sad. And also you know, because really they've got the, the, also cause often because they've got the most accessible voice or the smoothest production, you know. Yeah. Often you've got to just learn to look past the production sometimes. You know, I love good production, but often yes. I'm more interested I'm more interested in what, what's the person saying, what's the melody they're singing, you know, what's the yeah. feeling in there. And and often people yeah. don't even have ears ears to hear that anymore if the production's not fantastic and the voice isn't mm. smooth and fantastic, you know. Yeah. That's why I've always uh, that's why I've always like admired people like Bob Dylan and Neil Young and you know, like um, David Byrne from the Talking Heads and yeah. these guys who don't have these classically beautiful voices, but they just fucking put it out there anyway, and it, <laughs> yeah. and it comes through. You know, they've they've got such brilliance that it comes through that they overcome that disadvantage and turn it into an advantage. Actually, I mean, for me, Bob Dylan's voice is one of his biggest assets, but most people wouldn't agree. You know, because they're too kind of blinkered in their ideas of what a good voice is. Um, oh. not, not his voice now. You know, his voice when he was young. I wouldn't say that about his voice now. He's Bob Dylan really does croak now. But like, geez, when he was in his <laughs> twenty, tw when he was in his twenties, his voice for me was just an unbelievably flexible, like amazing thing. You know. 
yeah. And but what, what do you think of um, like Rodriguez as a singer? Yeah, you know, I mean, some of the first songs I learned to play were Rodriguez songs. Um, it was just a thing when we were growing up. Everyone had a Rodriguez tape somewhere. Yeah. Someone's brother had a Rodriguez tape. Um, yeah, no, I think Rodriguez is great, you know. But I don't, certainly don't think he's on the level of Bob Dylan or Neil Young. I, I, I don't think it's simply like, you know, he just got overlooked. I think he did partly get overlooked in America, maybe because he was Hispanic and just, you know. Yeah. There was some kind of racist racism in the in the record industry, um, but yeah, it could also be. I mean, he was just like maybe a bit too introverted as well, you know. Mm. Um, and I think he, yeah, he, his his songs are great, um, but I don't think he's Bob Dylan or Neil Young. <laughs> Simon. I don't think he's, I, don't, I don't think he's on that level. But I mean, shit, that's setting the bar very high, you know. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but yeah. but to that point as well, just talking about like the shiny objects is like if people just appreciated amazing uh, artists and musicians, more people would listen to jazz, wouldn't they? Because it would be like, but it's not easy to listen to necessarily because it's kind of yeah, you know. no, it's it's you you it's like it's like. Um learning to appreciate good wine you know when you're a kid the first time you taste wine it's like, yeah. gross why do people drink that <laughs> and 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 that's 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 what i think about most of most of what you hear on the radio it's the music you hear on the radio is the equivalent of a mcdonald's hamburger <laughs> you know or kentucky fried chicken or whatever like you eat it it's like mm, and you like straight away it's instant gratification yeah but it doesn't nourish you and it's not good for you um whereas <laughs> the really the really good music is more like you know like a i don't know like a whole wheat sandwich which blue cheese doesn't necessarily <laughs> yeah exactly yeah it's just stuff that, that that you can get into if you like just discipline yourself a bit yeah, it's much better exactly. for you in the long run um yeah. so I, you know the best music you often don't like it the first time you hear it I mean, I know that from my experiences, there's albums which I just didn't really get at first. And I, because I kept trying or had friends who kept playing them, Jesus, I learned to love it so much more than I could have loved, like, you know, the pop the stuff you hear on the radio that you're sick of after, like, three listens. Yeah, totally. So, I mean, good, good music has stuff that you keep discovering and you keep appreciating because it's, it's more subtle, I suppose. Yeah, jeez. Yeah. I, I often go to like uh, music gigs and I just hear like so many guys, like the, like just small ones, you know, and you're like, wow, these guys are so good and they should be so famous, you know, and, yeah. but they, I guess that, you know, like as you said, it's a struggle. They kind of like, they, they don't kind of get out there into the mainstream. Um, I was just, something just popped into my head. I'd, have you ever heard of a musician called C6 Steve? Yeah, yeah, I heard him. No, yeah, that was like ten years ago that I heard um, he was he was a bit of a sensation because yeah. the, the the idea was that he was like a, he was like a, a burgie, like a guy off the street, yeah, who they discovered, uh, um, and and he was had all these songs and he was suddenly became like quite a sensation. But I haven't really followed what what's become of him. Yeah, no, I mean he's so so he I I've actually I. I saw him at a music festival he had in the UK and was completely blown away by him. He was really bad. Wow. the most incredible. And since then I've like gone and seen him like three or four times. And he basically, oh, okay. yeah, he's so good, but he makes all his own, uh, like instruments. Like he makes, um, guitars out of like flipping pieces of car metal and leather and like, like just, mm -hmm. He is he is like mm. the type of guy that you know you're so happy that eventually makes it into the mainstream because he was like you said he was down and out he um, you know he was a drunkard he you know but he was just this amazing musician and he just he also he wasn't even interested for a long time he's like no I'm not even interested in you big record labels I'm gonna just do my own thing <laughs> <laughs> and then eventually he he you know he got really noticed and like couldn't. Re couldn't say no, I guess, to, you know, to the people that were saying you've got to get out there. And he did. 
and a really cool guy though like like really still very authentic in his music but also as a person you know like and his songs mm. are like, like the the lyrics are exactly what you said like these are stories about him and his struggle and you know you can you you can mm. really sort of feel that inside you when you listen to them and it's so cool mm. he's a really cool guy mm. Um, mm, I missed I missed to check cool. him out again. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And and so so, what about things like Spotify? Mm. Is that sort of has that helped? You know, you have you found it at all? Is it does it get the music out there? Or? Um, I think it's you know, it, uh, it's useful if if um, people are listening, if people know who you are, to go and find you on Spotify. Mm. And if the I don't know to what extent the Spotify algorithms are associating me with you know you, people are always making playlists based on a song on spotify so you ideally want people to discover your music through similar music Genre. but i actually check yeah i mean i did i went onto spotify the other day and found one of my songs and made a playlist based on my song and all it did was throw up other south african musicians oh, across yeah. all genres it wasn't really like I didn't do what I hoped it would do and like put me alongside the musicians I love and respect and wish, yeah. would wish to be associated. With. So, you know, I mean, I guess it's also because I'm they're only going to do that if you're getting enough people listening to you in the first place. So you've got to be quite, you've got to be getting a lot of hits on Spotify to, for it to help in that way, I guess. But it is, it is nice that people who have heard of me can go into Spotify and listen yeah. um, and tell their friends about, tell their friends about it. Um, but it doesn't, I don't know how musicians are ever going to make money out of Spotify. It's really just mm. such a tiny fraction. Unless you, the tiny fraction of musicians who are huge, you know, and really getting millions and more billions of plays on Spotify, you're not actually going to make much money. Um, I'm, you know, so who knows? This is just the way the music industry is going, and it's, it's not good. I mean... The, the, the guys at the top the, the, who own these companies are becoming billionaires rather than the musicians, it seems. Mm. Yeah, but I was actually listening to um, Steven Tyler. He was on the Joe Rogan podcast uh, recently. I don't know if you've heard of it, heard it but um, it was really interesting. Yeah. Did, did you hear him on that podcast? No, no. Uh, it's, it's a good one to listen to because he, I mean, he, his story is fascinating and he's, he's definitely out there and, and the drugs have affected him a lot, that's for sure. But, um, but such a cool guy and he talks a lot about, like a lot about everything, you know, but especially um, he says, he talks about Spotify and he, he said exactly what you're saying now. It's the guys at the top that are like not even new musicians. They're just these tech guys that set these companies up and they're making billions and yes. and that really winds him up like he hates that right because he's a old hard yeah. hardcore like proper musician mm. same as you you know and he's set up this organization now uh which specifically is on the musician side of things and make sure that they are getting paid the correct amount that for what they should be because he said there was one example I can't remember the guy's name, but it was a fairly well-known singer, and and he had somehow calculated that Spotify owed him two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, but had never paid it to him because that's just not how you know they, it worked for them. And off the mm. back of that, mm. um, that's when Stephen got involved and he set up this organization. And now he said for the first time ever. Uh, musicians have this organization to back them up to get money from companies like Spotify. So maybe it's stuff like that that shifts things so that the money does start, you know, trickling down and going to the right places as opposed to just one big leader at the top. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So who knows? I mean, remains to be seen, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I don't, I don't have too much hope for it getting better. I mean, in a way, it's 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 okay. I mean, musicians should really be should, musicians shouldn't be getting like stinkingly rich. They should be, you know, getting a good living. And yeah, I mean, the money needs to come down to the musicians, not just make the people at the top rich. But it is it is nice that there's, I mean, for the consumer, it's fantastic having access to all this music. And it's yeah. I suppose good for, good for musicians to have this way of getting their music out there and. The hope is that 
you know, people, enough people can hear your music that when you go and do a show, you'll get people coming to your shows. And that, for me, really is like the, 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 way, the way musicians should be making money, actually, is getting out and playing shows. Mm-hmm. And people should yeah. be people should be getting out and going to shows. Yeah. And that's really, yeah, that's, exactly. that really is the, the, the best, the best exchange. Um, totally. Yeah. Anyway. That's, yeah. Who, who knows where it's going. And it's to the play. best way to experience someone's what, you know, that rawness that the, you mm. know, the, the, the best judge of a good band in my opinion is when you're watching them in a intimate venue or something and they're right there and you're listening to them. And if they still can like, get your heart racing and it's just an amazing uh, event uh, yeah. in terms of, you know, that's when you know, like, wow, like what a musician. It's not just, like you said earlier, like mastered and, edit, or, you know, whatever mm. they do to make it sound super chic. Um, yeah. it, it's, yeah. that's not, that's not real life, you know? So, but, you know, in attempt to, in an attempt to, to, to put your music into a, a bit of a genre or a box or whatever you want to, a description, People are, you've been described as a unique blend of folksy, foot tapping, red wine, fireside poetry. And I think that's must be one of the coolest descriptions I've ever heard. And uh, w- would you say it's fitting? Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I, uh, that was actually um, pulled straight out of an email from a fan in, in PE, actually. This woman in <laughs> cool. PE wrote us an email, and that, and that is what she said about us. Um, and I love it so much that I've been using it ever since as a, like a sort That's of a awesome. promo thing. Um, yeah, it's 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 a lovely little uh, bit of poetry from her actually. Yeah, and, so, and sure. are you playing many gigs now these days? Not a whole lot, you know. We we've got a gig coming up um, on the fifteenth of June. There's this very cool little venue in Cape Town called the Alma Cafe. Um, where what's great about playing there is they've got a really good sound system and people know when they come nice. there it's about the music and they've got to shut up while we sing which <laughs> is always good nice. um so we're playing there uh otherwise yeah nothing nothing booked at the moment um yeah I and mean, we we as i say we're busy strategizing on what to do going forward with all these new songs um and we are having band meetings to nice. strategize yeah we're starting we in fact you so 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 my bassist eric um now his day job is he's um what you'd call a like a life coach like he goes into into companies and teaches people mm. skills and how to be more productive and get their get their mm. shit together basically yeah so he's very kindly volunteered to act on in that capacity with the band. And so we're now having these band meetings where we where we like looking at our goals and strategizing about how to, you know, get where we need to be because clearly we're not where we need to be. We sing in Cape Town and no one not that many people have heard our music and we want to get our music out there. So we we're starting to look at at how we're gonna to get to Australia and do a tour there. So um, that's cool. hopefully gonna gonna happen, but we uh, yeah. So sweet, look forward so to that's it. That's where we're at. That's where we're at. Yeah, yeah. If you've got any ideas of, of the ideas, we need to find a band that's kind of you know got a good following over there, but that we're a good match for. So um, yeah, we just we're just thinking of bands that, that might might be keen at the moment, trying to find. So if you've got any ideas, you know, definitely keep know. my yeah yeah definitely. Definitely keep keep my ear to the ground for you, for sure. Yeah, and 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 so Simon, like just before uh, we we wrap up, but um, what is the best way for people to find out about you and the band? Um, we've got a website, uh, but actually, even better than the website. I mean, the website's got some bios and photos and videos, some nice videos on the website. But I mean, if you just Google Simon van Gent band. You're going to come up with everything you need to know. Um, but I, will send, I tend to send people to Bandcamp. So bandcamp.com. Um, and, and I think it'll just be forward slash Simon van Gent. Mm-hmm. Um, and there you can stream all my albums. All five of my albums are there. You can stream them in their, in their entirety. So you don't actually have... It's not like on 
iTunes where you get like 30 seconds of a song as a preview if you're not subscribed. Okay. On Bandcamp, they let you listen. You, you can you can actually there's like a little radio button you can click and it'll play everything. Awesome. Um, but you can but you but you can also go on there and buy the albums and it's not like Spotify where I only get like half a percent. You, our, the band will get like I think 80 percent of what mm. you pay on. Oh, ah, cool. That's on, really band, good. On Bandcamp. So, so it's, that's actually the place to go if you're interested in sending money to the actual bands, to the actual musicians. Okay, oh, that's great. To know. Know. There's, a lot, there's a lot of stuff up there. Yeah. So bandcamp.com. Yeah. Great, thank you. Yeah, well, and well, and I saw in, in your in your little uh, email that word doc that there were you were asking about Simon and the band apart versus Simon van Gent, and that was actually just a, a name we used for the fourth album, and it was in retrospect a bit of a dumb move because now we've got this confusion. We we had this idea we were going to be called instead of being being about me, it was going to be more about the band. And Eric is French, the bass player, and he came up with this name Simon and the band apart because it's kind of a French thing yeah. from the past. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> but that's also it turned, it turned out people really struggled to find the right spelling for that. And we just thought it's simpler to go back to what we've always been, which is the Simon van Gent band. So. <laughs> cool. cool <stuff>. <laughs> <laughs> and that's for our international listeners, it's G E N D again, like a uh, yeah. band. Yeah, so, so, yeah. Three, so, so it's three words Simon, van, and then Gend, G E N D. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Not always easy for for the, the to get the her right. <laughs> so yeah. listen, Simon, yeah. we've had a great chat to you. Like, I really just want to thank you so much uh, for spending the time with us today. It's been a real pleasure. Just um, you know, Good. coming Glad. sitting with with two you know two big fans here, music fans in general as well, and um, you know it's it's a real honor to get a chance to. To, to get down to the inner workings of a of a musician and someone that's um, uh, a master of their craft and uh, and that you know should be known better like you were saying like you someone that that is is putting out really good quality music and um, I look forward to seeing your your band go from strength to strength because it deserves it you know and um, and but thanks again and and keep up the good work. Uh, and uh, and and we look uh, forward to hearing that uh, fifth album. What is it now? The, would that be the sixth? Sixth. It'll be, be fifth. fifth. Yeah. Sixth. sixth. Yeah, yeah. Sixth yeah, album. Six, I yeah. looked. I look. We really look forward to that. And uh, and have yourself a wonderful day. And thanks again for for really just um, being vulnerable with us and for our listeners to to get that insight into your life. Thank you. Sure. Well, no. I mean, it's wonderful to be able to talk about myself at length. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I could I could do it all day, <laughs> but I do have but I do have work to do. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but so <laughs> so so just from my side, I also well, firstly, I would like to you know maybe uh, with your permission, see if we could possibly use one of your songs in in our intro on on our podcast. Um, oh, absolutely! And, uh, yeah. That that would be that would be quite cool, you be know, great, for, yeah. for your podcast for for this episode to play some of your music. That would be really cool. Um, and then, yeah, just thank you so much for sharing your story. Like, it, it's very valuable to hear like the the intricacies and the struggles that um, you know people go through. And and you know, like Craig said, like for for opening up and just being vulnerable, I think. First of all, that's very tough, but um, but we you know we really think that there's so much value in doing that, and um, I certainly just learnt a lot about a lot of different things today. And um, I got tons of notes that I that I want to go through, and um, yeah, but also like th there was just like I don't know, like a real nice human element to this chat, you know, like and mm. it it went deep and. I I know that I'm going to have to re-listen to it because there's a lot there that that is really worth listening to and that our listeners are going to find a lot of value in. So, um, you know, thank you so much for that. And I could feel right. like the tone, like I said, your voice changed um, when you spoke about the progress that you've made uh, with your latest therapist yeah. and. That mm. was so cool and so promising, you know, yeah. like, and it's, it was really, yeah, really yeah, obvious. Yeah. 
and you could feel it like this energy shift which was yeah. really cool so i'm mm. just super excited about you know the the future progress and also the um you know the what your music is going to be like and then sort of you know you guys promoting yourself in a different way like you maybe have before mm. and and having this different energy on stage and that's super cool man and uh yeah Brilliant. it's been a cool chat so thank you very much for for everything and for you know over two hours of your time today we really appreciate it yeah <laughs> it's a pleasure well thank you guys and thanks for organizing such a, a great podcast i think um cool yeah, I, I haven't actually heard of a podcast that takes this approach, and I think it's a really, really cool thing. So I'm actually going to go and have a listen to some of your other ones Thank now, you. I think. Thanks, man. Not, not right now, but once, yeah, yeah. once my work done. Yeah. Yeah, no yeah. worries. They're long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, and, cool, and one day, at one at one stage, it would be lovely, lovely to have you little play us a, a song uh, there for us, and we can can throw that up as one of our interludes somewhere and uh, and give you some more promo. That'd be cool. I'd yeah, be happy yeah. to do that. Awesome. That'd be awesome, man. Thank you. We love you. Waking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour, and up in the air. Stop at the toll, digging for change. Snowy Cape Fold, mountain range. Gotta be quick, so far to go. 